The date is Friday, May 14th, and you're listening to Entertain This, a thought-provoking podcast encapsulating all things entertainment. On this week's episode, we're taking a trip back in time to high school literature class to discuss a classic work of fiction by Voltaire. We are, of course, talking about Candide and how this scandalous book became a humorous assault on the philosophy of optimism. So enjoy! What is up, you guys? Welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast on the internet covering all things entertainment. That's right. You already know the game. You're listening to Entertain This. Entertain This. As always, I'm Alex. I'm Michael. And I'm Nick. And we welcome you back to another week. Uh, What I'm doing right now is something in comedy known as a cold opening. It's when somebody goes into some topic that is unrelated to the original topic for comedic effect. Now on to Nick for our topic this week. Hey, wait a minute. You didn't, I didn't prepare for this. You didn't prepare me for this. I didn't. We've already done this joke, guys. We can't keep pretending (laughs) we are unprofessional and didn't prepare for the week because people are going to start believing it's true. So we did that once. We did it with Michael's Monster Hunter episode. It ended up being really popular and probably set the president a lot of people's mind as to how our show goes. Uh, So no, you did prepare. How many pages are in your goddamn script? Tell me right now. Uh, Eight. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's get going. (laughs) I was expecting more of a warm opening. You know, you light a campfire for me and we all sit around on logs and... Nope. Nope. I've done a cold opening every week for the last 62 episodes. Well, uh, guys, today I'm here to talk to you about a topic. Shouldn't... uh, Wow. Yeah, it's it's somewhat uh, comedic in effect, too. Did you say a topag? No, a topic. A topic of conversation, see... Um, it's, it's a, uh, somewhat comedic because you mentioned the cold open with a cold opening was, um, uh, comedic in nature, correct? Yeah. It's often used by Conan O'Brien. Conan mm-hmm. O'Brien. Yes. A famous, he's comedian. famous. Yeah. I have a uh, story about another famous comedian. Um, he's been dead for a while. He's more of a satirist, if you will. Um, he's a man by the name of Voltaire and he wrote a book called, uh, Candide. Wow, you're right. This is a funny episode. Wow. <laughs> it's been wow. so funny so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm busting a gut over here. Now I'm over here wondering why you're going comedian because I took I took philosophy 101. I've heard the name Voltaire once or twice in my life. Yeah, he's uh he's big in the philosophy game for sure. Man, it must be cool to have gone to college. <laughs> <laughs> it's not special. I dropped out. <laughs> I dropped that shit like a panini. That shit was hot as <laughs> dropped it. But uh, speaking of philosophies, you know, there's a lot of uh, going back and forth about this this uh, philosophy of optimism, if you will. And you probably know someone that's optimistic, no matter what horrors befall them in their lives. Maybe no, we're we're from the millennial generation. We're all pretty pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if I if I did know that person, that person would be you. Unironically, yeah, it probably. is you. In my life, you are the optimistic person. This is a very bad indicator of how your life is going <laughs> thank you so much for that but anyways you might look at them with a sense of wonder or uh guttural disdain but one thing is certain they typically have a screw loose somewhere maybe you could say that about me i don't know <laughs> but it's just not normal or rational to be sunny side up all the time and i've got a story about a guy who gets the absolute shit kicked out of him multiple times only to have him still mutter while bleeding profusely out of the mouth. This is the best of all possible worlds. Does this sound crazy yet? We've only just scratched the surface, because today we're talking about a mid-18th century classic episodic novel by Voltaire entitled Candide or Optimism. As I ask you to listen along to the best of all possible podcasts, entertain this. Whoa. I like. That. I bet after listening to this episode, that intro will sound real clever. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded clever in my head as i was writing it but who knows it uh, is but you said it was a com- he was a comedian is that were there comedians in the 18th century i guess there were not, not in the way that you think of there wasn't a dude up on stage being like what's the deal with their line food of course you go with you gotta go with seinfeld, Jerry seinfeld. yeah of course you go with jerry but seinfeld. i think there was you know shakespeare had some comedic parts of his plays right 
Yeah, he talked about dicks way more than I think people give him credit for. <laughs> we should give a lot of credit for talking about dicks. Yeah. He there should there could be an entire college class called the dick jokes of the Shakespearean era. <laughs> And Honestly, they, they would I would have, have to work with. I would have probably paid a lot more attention in like AP Lit in high school. <laughs> it would have been AP Lit. You're right. AP Lit, definitely lit. Um, let's get back to Voltaire. <laughs> this is this is my lit class. All right, kids, we're gonna we're gonna get. I'm just gonna stop right there. Anyways, I got a pun about dick jokes. It's really not hard to make those kind of. Um, anyways, uh, so let me ask you: <laughs> Are you gonna tell us the pun, or did you just say that you had one? It's not hard to make dick jokes. That's the pun. Damn it, Alex. You see? (laughs) You made me explain it. Now it's not funny anymore. Are people still listening? (laughs) Probably not. But let me ask you. What do you know about this book called Candide? And it's okay if you say nothing. Nothing. Nothing? Okay. (laughs) Yep. Is it like Candide? Like Candide? Or is it like Candide? Like Can-deed? No, it's... it's, uh, Basically, think of candid, like candid camera, but with uh-huh. an e at the end. Okay, it's, is it yeah. written in a different language? It's important to note that yes, this was originally written in French. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so it's French for candid, is what it is. It could be. I don't know. I, I don't. Mm. I didn't study for French. Unfortunately. French. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know anything about it. Okay. Personally, I've never even heard of Voltaire. Because I am an uneducated boy from the backwoods of Kentucky. Kentucky. Um, I'm interested. Okay. That's okay. You're going to recognize this story as uh, something like uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's one of those stories that just gets recycled over and over and retold throughout time. I'm, I'm halfway expecting Disney to maybe make this into a motion picture. I don't know. We'll see. But... Uh, that's okay if you don't know anything, because I'm gonna I'm gonna fill you in here. And for all those high school students out there who are listening to this podcast, go read the book first of all. Um, it's a little hard to get into, but once you're once you're in the pages, you'll you'll get hooked onto that kind of satirical, kind of snarky storytelling uh, type of thing. So let me just give you a little background on Voltaire to fill in those crevices in your imagination here. Uh, no, he has nothing to do with electricity. You might be thinking of Alessandro Volta. He, he he's named after the electrical measurement, you know, volts. That's that's not this guy. Voltaire is quite a character with a very interesting life, as we'll find out. And by modern day standards, he's actually very cool. He's very enlightened, you might say, very uh, woke. It's another another cool kid word. So, could I compare him possibly to somebody who, um, like? did LSD once and now they're like, I'm on a whole different level from you, man. <laughs> Go ahead. I just, that's it. That's what I, okay. that's where I'm at right now. That's what I want to go into. Cause okay. if you're getting your ass kicked in alley and you're like, this is the best world that there is. I can't beat this. <laughs> is that not... a sad realization or a happy one? Yeah, is, and is he being genuine there? Is he being sarcastic? He's being major sarcastic. Oh, Majorly wow. sarcastic. I was gonna so, say because, like, I looked up the French word for can candide. Yeah, naive, naive. Ah, yeah. see, it's funny, right? Mm-hmm. It's the first of many little little haha funny moments. That's really what you do in these kind of books. You flip through them and you go, ah, or you do one of these the the poetry snaps. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're not sipping wine with this, then I don't know what you're doing. Um, unless you're oh, underage, man. of course. Don't 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 do that. Um, okay, and, so pour yourself a glass of wine and entertain this. Let's thank go. Thank you. There you go. In any event, uh, Voltaire was born in France in 1694 with the name of Francois Marie Arouet. So that's a very French name. But later on, he decides to go with Voltaire because he's being persecuted because he's being too snarky, apparently. Um, that's what I'm going to go to jail for. Yeah, for being too snarky. <laughs> <laughs> You were doing five snarks in a 55 limit. What do you? <laughs> Anyways, he's born during the reign of uh, Louis the 14th. And that's important because this was the time where France was kind of at the top of its power. Everyone looks back on these days like, oh, man, that was the that was the good old days of the monarchy. That was when everything was OK. He's also known as the Sun King. That's really not important, but I like just that nickname. OK, um, this becomes okay, get later... off my back about it. <laughs> Leave me alone about it, huh? 
this becomes important later on in the story. Um, but for now, it's going to become a mystery mouse tool that might help us later. I don't know. Um, he was born into nobility. Um, the French at this time are called the, the upper class is called the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie. Um, his father was a lawyer working for the crown, you know, doing lawyer stuff back then. And uh, gave him some A-tier education for the time period. Mm-hmm. And being educated by Jesuits, which is a religious order of Catholicism, known luckily here around here for founding the St. Xavier High School, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. Yeah, a Jesuit institution. But he was educated at the College Louis Le Grand from 1704 to 1711, where he was taught Can you say Latin. that with a, with a thicker accent, please? I don't know. Listen, if you're looking at me for French accents. No, come on. Just a little yeah, yeah. thicker. College Louis Le Grand. Uh, okay, you go. You go, Michael. College de Louis de Grant. <laughs> oh, yeah, that over there, that's a college, Louis de Grant, I think. <laughs> hey, you know that one town in Kentucky called Versailles? <laughs> hey, I don't know about that there, Versailles. You know, I was looking for something along the lines Kentucky of like, joke. there you go, of like, uh, something like, Louis de Grand, you know, like, yeah. You, know that. Oh, you put some, you got put it. some nasty on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's from all the cheese then we eat. Next time I hear my name, put some nasty on it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Next time you sorry. say the name, I better hear a little nasty on it. <laughs> um, he was taught Latin. Obviously, he spoke French. French. He was taught theology and rhetoric. And later in life, he became fluent in Italian, Spanish, and English. And so kind of a, yeah, and sarcasm, not to leave that out. Quite the Renaissance, man. Well, post Renaissance, for being technical, but <laughs> shut up, Nick. That's what everyone's saying. Um, he goes out into the world after this education, and his father kind of sets him up to be a lawyer, but he doesn't want to do that, much like our boy Franz Kafka, right? Mm-hmm. He had a stint in pretending to work in Paris as an assistant to the, uh, a notary, but instead he spent most of his time writing poetry. And his father found out he was playing pretend. And he sent Voltaire to study law, this time in Sienne, Normandy, which I'm going to pretend I know where that is. But I don't want to be a lawyer, Papa. I want to be a dancer. (laughs) (laughs) He says, I want to be a poet. Um, He continues to write, producing essays and historical studies. One thing that I like to keep in mind about Voltaire is that he's absolutely prolific. He wrote a ton of stuff. And it just happens to be that Candide survived the, uh, the winds of time as they were and it's still a great book today. So in 1713, his father obtained him a job as secretary to the new French ambassador to the Netherlands. He keeps trying to prod him into anything other than being a writer, because apparently that's what dads do during this time period and even today. But at The Hague, which is, I think, another its a city in the Netherlands, Voltaire fell in love with a French Protestant refugee named Catherine Olympie de Neveur, also known as Pimpette. That's a pet Pimpette. name. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that he ordained upon her. But it's important to note at this time, Catholicism was kind of the law of the land in France. And Protestants were not allowed at all. So their affair, considered scandalous, scandalous, was discovered. And Voltaire was forced to return to France by the end of the year. So he's having a little affair. He's having a little fun in the other ones. And then he's like, all right. He's cheating on his pipette? No, he's not cheating on he's. I don't know what it is. It's because it's one of those things where Pimpette was one of the uh, royals of the Netherlands and she was Protestant. Let's not forget that Protestants and Catholics aren't allowed to mingle at all during this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it gets kind of sticky with him and then he has to go back. To Ew. St- not, not like that. I'm sorry. A big apologies. Crazy. Um, our showrunner <laughs> picks the best time to run our <laughs> our yeah. usernames across the screen for our visual listeners out there. Our visual listeners. <laughs> yeah, Michael, for people who are listening to the podcast and watching our visual bit, it's our visual <laughs> listeners. Mm-hmm. The visual mm-hmm. bit. But uh, back in France, he gets into more trouble with the authorities once again for his critiques of the government, which is not allowed at this point. Um As a result, he gets twice sentenced to prison uh, where he, okay, (laughs) doing the more visual bits. Um, He did a satirical verse in which he accused the regent of his town, which I guess is like a governor 
of incest with his daughter. Wow. Which is, you know, that's that's not really cool. But huh? it resulted in <laughs> he accused Hold on. He was like, Hey Regent, I bet you 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 have incest with your daughter, right? Oh, like okay. Those type of things. Yeah. The character has lined up once more. Yeah. yeah. And then as a result, he's imprisoned in the Bastille, which is a, you know, a kind of famous prison in France. Mm-hmm. But he's like, come on, dudes, learn to take a joke. And he then he gets out of prison and he decides to go by Voltaire because it's not only his pen name, but he gave it to himself to elude the authorities. Mm. So that's where he kind of gets this, uh, you know, the Batman thing where he puts on the mask and becomes someone else, I guess. I'm Voltaire. Voltaire. So, so is Voltaire like one of the originators of the like come on guys it was just a prank <laughs> could have been yeah it could have been like that um I'm sure he didn't actually say those exact words because <laughs> well he wasn't speaking French of course um, oh it could have been a prank come on <laughs> it was a prank bro <laughs> It was, uh, you say, uh, just a prank. Come on. <laughs> but after I that, I don't want to sleep with no. <laughs> more stuff happens in his life. Blah, blah, blah. He travels here and there, all while being an absolutely prolific writer, making these writings in prose, poetry, pamphlets about the government and religion, which people eat up. And as you can imagine, he's drawing a lot of flack from the authorities. And perhaps that's why he moves around so much, but he's kind of a man on the run outlaw type of deal. Mm. Um, this period of history is important to note too, because this is an age known as the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. You guys know anything about that? I do. Yeah. What do you know? Yeah. Off the top of your dome. Off the top of my dome, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but it's familiar. Are we it's talking about the? Age of enlightenment? We're yeah. talking about the age of enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it a big religious uh, movement? Actually, to the opposite. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I meant. It was like it. Yeah. They, it was a big that's movement. Right. This is yeah. where, like, all the ideas of like separation of church and state, yep, and, like, yeah, uh, freedom of religion, and all that sort of came into play. Yeah, yeah, it was it was like when people stopped making art about God and Jesus and started making art about the human experience and stuff like that too. And about science that was a big and part scientific of it. theory and Isaac Newton mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, so it's a pretty big deal, and a lot of the kind of fundamental texts about this country are framed around this idea of the Enlightenment too. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, pursuit of happiness, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all in the Constitution. Whether or not we follow it, I don't know. Um, But We sure do try our best, don't we? We we really do. Um, We as individuals. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, If the Enlightenment doesn't sound familiar, let me just define where it is. The Enlightenment included a range of ideas centered around the pursuit of happiness, sovereignty of reason, and the evidence of the senses as the primary source of knowledge, and advanced ideals such as liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and separation of church and state. So there you go. We, we checked the boxes. Check, check, check. You know, that's all. Oh, of yeah. them. We're smart. We're smart. Um, but like the founding fathers and the other Enlightenment thinkers of the time, Voltaire was a deist, which means that he believes that God exists or existed, but then he left the world long ago. Simply setting the gears and cogs in motion and sits back with a long island iced tea and watches it run. He is quoted as saying, what is faith? Is it to believe that which is evident? No. It is perfectly evident to my mind that there exists a necessary, eternal, supreme, and intelligent being. This is no matter of faith, but of reason. So that's all to say you aren't going to find him in a church on Sunday, but he definitely has a grip on the world around him, thanks to the creator for it. This is further proof of this deism in one of his denunciations of priests of every religious sect. Voltaire describes them as people who rise from an incestuous bed, manufacture a hundred versions of God, then eat and drink God, then piss and shit God. And he's really rude about this. He's a master of dark humor, which leads to a lot of his writing being banned and burned. So I want you to imagine in the theater of your mind, this 17-year-old self-proclaimed annoying atheist who just got done watching a bunch of Richard Dawkins videos and is snarky and sarcastic about everything. That's Voltaire, okay? (laughs) And he was a just a prank bro guy. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God, he's the worst. (laughs) He's the worst, but he's, damn it, sometimes you just need a good satire video just to, you know, put you to bed at night or have a good hearty chuckle. 
Mm-hmm. From what I know, the French are not known for their sense of humor. So it's nice <laughs> just to see through the veil. And there's one guy out there who's trying his best. <laughs> he's he's out here doing it. Um, but let me explain why he's so woke. Remember how I said he was woke back then? Um, in the 1700s, people were known for blatant racism. I, I don't think that's out of the question. But his most famous remark on slavery is found within Candide, where the hero is horrified to learn at what price we eat sugar in Europe. After coming across a slave in French Guiana, who's been mutilated for escaping, who opines that if all human beings had the common origins in the Bible taught, it makes them cousins, including that no one could treat their relatives more horribly. So that's kind of, you know, a horrible thing that existed back then. And Voltaire was clearly aware of it. Um, well, what he did to stop it, I don't know. It's kind of one of those forces that you really can't get in the way of. Um, I mean, like at the time, like even just talking about it is kind of doing something. It was taboo. Yeah. Yeah. He was doing his best to uh, kind of slow down the slave trade because like, I mean, it was a horrible back then. Mm-hmm. And it's just a horrible experience to live through. But um, let me close out the bibli- bibli- bibliographic biographical portion of the show. There you go. I have just one more fun fact about our boy Voltaire. He was known to be an, an advocate for coffee. He is reported to have drunk it 50 to 72 times per day and goes on to live a full 83 years, dying in 1778. Like so, sip? I don't know. It, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't really terrifying. specify. It just says, hey, Voltaire drank a lot of coffee. So, all right, great. <laughs> I do too. What's new? Um, but let's get to the book, shall we? Uh, let's talk about the characters in this book. A lot of these characters are less realistic people and more of a conduit for the attitudes and events that surrounded them. Their opinions and actions are determined almost entirely by the influence of outside factors. And before we get started, let me just say that this story has been adapted several ways and made into several derivative works, including an operetta by the same name and has music composed by a friend of the show, Leonard Bernstein, in 1956 on Broadway of all places. Yeah, Neat. so I, fig- I figured that might tickle your your theater minds over there. Maybe not. That's cool too. Um, I have no idea what the difference between a play and an operetta is, but you know, whatever. Maybe that's for a fact checker to. Uh, I'm trying to summon her. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> um, but you've got the titular character of Candide. He's a good-hearted but hopelessly naive young man, right? Remember how you said he's naive because that's mm-hmm, his literal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Um, his mentor Pangloss teaches him that the, their world is the best of all possible worlds. And Candide travels the world and meets a wide variety of misfortunes. His faith in Can- Pangloss, undiluted optimism, is repeatedly tested. So really, he's more, less of a character and more of a, a camera to show you, the reader, what's going on in his crazy story. A, mm-hmm. a sort of Candide camera, if you will. <laughs> Hey, there she is. Uh, you're getting fact checked. Bitch. What's up, guys? <laughs> well, he summoned me. I did. I did. Ah, so, well, we're here. <laughs> I just thought it'd be fun to um, clarify the difference between like a play, an opera, and an operetta for Please the do. audience. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Welcome to entertain so, us. Candide, okay. yeah, entertain this. Candide was an operetta, and an opera is a show that's fully sung through. There is no spoken dialogue that tells the story. An okay. operetta, however, is a shorter opera, because usually they're like four hours long. Um, it tends to be funny, and it has spoken dialogue in it. So it's like a step down from an opera. Like, it's it's a mini opera, operetta. Okay. And a play, obviously, doesn't have music that's sung, because then it's a musical. So that's your fact check for the night. Thanks wow. for having Yay. me. Nice. I feel, I feel enlightened. <laughs> I hope I'm feeling enlightened too. Thanks. Loving the, the philosophy. So I'm out. We'll get Big to that vibes. later. We'll get to that later. We have wow, that was philosophy. crazy. Who was that? that was what our, just happened? That was a resident fact checker, Chloe. Yeah, of course. Yeah, everybody knows that, right? Everybody mm-hmm. knows that. Come on. Um, continuing on with the characters, if I may, uh, you have Pangloss, who is a philosopher and Candide's personal tutor. His optimistic beliefs are the primary target of the novel satire. Pangloss's own, 
<coughs> excuse me, Pangloss's own experiences contradict this belief, but he remains faithful to it nonetheless. And once again, Pangloss is one of these uh, very flat characters who is used by the author as a parody of the overly optimistic Enlightenment philosophers. And it's interesting to note, even among the Enlightenment age, there were fractures within this philosophy and a lot more nuance than the history books would lead us to believe. So continuing on with the characters, we have Cunegonde, who is the daughter of the German baron who acts as Candide's benefactor until he discovers Candide's got the hots for his daughter, right? His daughter mm -hmm. is, of course, Cunegonde. Uh, but she is young and beautiful. She is neither intelligent nor complex. Her very blandness casts a satiric light on Candide's mad romantic passion for her. Imagine this good-looking woman who doesn't pay two blinks of attention to you, and you become infatuated with her. Because that's that's kind of how love works, right? But <laughs> <laughs> her name is a dirty joke in French, too, uh, referring to the female genitalia, uh, coming from Latin cunis, right? French oh. con. Uh, I won't get into the full word, but see, it's it's where you get the word uh, cunnilingus, coming from two words in Latin, meaning female genitalia and licking, of course. Lingus. Thanks for um, that lesson, Nick. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, first one's free. <laughs> then you have uh, Martin, who is a cynical scholar from whom Candide befriends as a travel companion. Martin has suffered a great deal in his life and preaches a philosophy of undiluted pessimism. More knowledgeable and intelligent than either Candide or Pangloss. He kind of serves the, as the counterpoint to Pangloss. Martin is nonetheless a flawed philosopher because he always expects nothing from the worst from the world. He often has trouble seeing the world as it really is because of this. Then we have one more character here. There's a lot more that I won't get to because that would take up the entire podcast, but Kakambo, who comes as Candide's valet when Candide travels to South America. He's a mixed race native of the Americas, and he is uh, highly intelligent and morally honest. He's savvy and single-handedly rescues Candide from a number of scrapes. He is also directly responsible for Candide's reunion with Cunegonde. Uh, as a practical man of action, he stands in direct opposition to the ineffectual philosophers such as Pangloss and Martin, who like to kind of stand back and go, hoo -bah, hoo -bah, hoo -bah, discuss ad nauseum. Well, he's more of a man of action. They go like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know how philosophers talk. Come on. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we know how it goes. Uh, so let me get to the plot here. Now that I've kind of set the stage with the characters, we have our Barbie dolls. Uh, I've kind of set the dollhouse that we're playing with these in, I think. Um, because it kind of takes place all over the world. There isn't one particular set, uh, if we're thinking about this in playwright terms. But Candide is the illegitimate nephew of a German baron, which he's being raised with in his castle, uh, Thunder Ten Tronk, or however you pronounce that. But he grows up in the baron's castle under the tutelage of scholar Pangloss, who teaches him that this world is the best of all possible worlds. And Candide falls in love with the baron's young daughter, Cunegonde. She sees Pangloss getting busy with a chambermaid in some bushes and is feeling a little frisky, leading her to, of course, smooch Candide. The Baron catches the two kissing and expels Candide from his home. On his own, for the first time, Candide is conscripted by the army of Bulgars, which is inspired by the Seven Years' War, which is taking place at the time of the book's publishing. Mm -hmm. um, it's on this side of the ocean, of course, and we call it um, the French and Indian War. And interestingly enough, it's the war that strikes the ire of the American colonists after the British raise taxes without representation to finance their debts. So this indirectly kind of leads to America being created, which is kind of cool, huh. I guess. But um, this the Seven Years World Seven Years War is the first World War in air quotes here, because you had military alliances from all over the the globe, like the French, uh, Canadians, the English. Um, I think the Spaniards got involved with this too, but basically you have all these big monarchies, you know, just duking it out here in the Americas. There's a lot of battles and good old general George Washington was part of one of those. And that's how he kind of rose to fame over here. So that was, that was a side tangent, but I couldn't resist. Um, anyways, he wanders away from the camp for a brief walk and is brutally flogged as a deserter in this army camp. So that's the first of many very violent acts in the book. 
but they always just kind of gloss over it like it's some kind of Tom and Jerry cartoon. You know, Tom and Jerry can get flattened with a big old rubber mallet, and they just the next scene they're perfectly fine. That's kind of how this book plays out. Um, but after witnessing a horrific battle, he manages to escape and travels to Holland. Does this, does this sound familiar yet? Because it sounds like also, the life of Voltaire. Yeah. Exactly. It sounds like he just wrote his own story out as a satire. He pretty much did in a lot of ways. Um, at least in the first, I don't know, 10 chapters of the book. They're really small chapters, so it's important to keep in mind if you're if you're a night reader like me. You can get through one chapter and then go to bed. Um, but in Holland, he meets a kindly Anabaptist named Jacques, who takes Candide in. And he runs into a deformed ve- beggar and discovers that it is Pangloss. <laughs> Pangloss hey. explains that he contracted syphilis and that Cunegonde and her family have all been brutally murdered by the Bulgar army. Again, But it's like a joke, you know? It's like funny when know. he says it, probably. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what's the deal with my entire family getting murdered? Right, guys? I mean, <laughs> that's, that's pretty common in this world, I think. Uh, so nonetheless, he maintains his optimistic outlook. Jacques takes Pangloss in as well, and the three travel to Libsyn, Portugal together. But before they arrive, their ship runs into a storm, and Jacques is drowned. So just like that, he he dies, and that's that's all cool. Okay. It's all rosy. Whatever. <laughs> um, Jeez. <laughs> it's kind of like this comical Games of Thrones, Games of Thrones type of thing where characters just die and nobody cares. Um, <laughs> You've never watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> I watched one episode, and it was not very enjoyable. People die and everybody cares. That's Game of Thrones. Except for me, because I didn't watch the show. <laughs> totally fair. But uh, Candide and Pangloss arrive in Libsyn, Portugal, of course, to find it destroyed by an earthquake and under the control of the Inquisition. This is an actual historic event on All Saints Day of 1755 that Voltaire is said to have witnessed firsthand. First, there's like an earthquake, and then there's a fire triggered by the earthquake, and then there's a tsunami. Like, Libsyn just gets beat to a pulp during this uh, year, and all within like succession of each other. So, they're not in good shape. Best of all possible worlds? Uh, I don't know, man. Candy is, you know, he's naive nonetheless. Uh, but Pangloss is soon hanged as a heretic because he gets into an argument with the Inquisition about uh, philosophy or something like that. Um, so it's it's another thing that's kind of like oh no he died he died big deal, um, mm-hmm. and then Candide is flogged for listening with approval to Pangloss's philosophy. So <laughs> after this beating, an old woman dresses Candide's wounds and then, to his astonishment, takes him to Cunegond. Cunegond explains that through the Bulgars, though the Bulgars killed the rest of her family, she was merely raped and then captured by a captain who has sold her to a Jew named Don Isagar. At the present, she is a sex slave jointly owned by Don Isagar and the Grand Inquisitor of Lisbon. Each of Cunegonde's two owners arrive in turn as she and Candide are talking, and Candide kills them both. Again, more cartoonish violence. He just gets so overwhelmed with feeling, he's just like, whips out a sword and goes, double kill, right? He gets a kill streak or something like that. (laughs) Double kill. (laughs) But, uh, Terrified, Candide, the old woman, and Cunegonde flee and board a ship bound for South Africa. Because at this point, the Inquisitors and the, uh, the the tribe of Jewish people there are they're on his tail. They want him dead because obviously you just killed two people. You can't you can't do that and not expect any repercussions. I mean, come on. But I mean, haven't journey, people been dying left and right this entire show? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, it seems like a lot of people are just kind of getting away with it. Oh yeah, people are just kind of. I don't know. It's it's a weird world at this point. Um, yeah, lots of death, lots of death, lots of cartoonish death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, lots of death for sure. <laughs> hmm. But during their journey, the old woman has this long ass backstory that no one really cares. No, I'm kidding. Everyone cares about it. Um, she was born the Pope's daughter of all people, which I didn't know popes were allowed to do that. But apparently, back in this time. Mm-hmm. It was okay. Because right, um, they made the rules. I don't think popes <laughs> are allowed to do that, if I'm being honest. You're forgetting the golden rule, of course, which is he with the gold makes all the rules. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but she suffers a litany of misfortunes, including sexual assault, enslavement, and cannibalism. Um, 
and she just goes on this long tangent about all this stuff that happens to her. It's really sad and heartbreaking, but eventually um, it all ends and you're like, oh, this is an old lady. She's pretty cool. Um, so after that, Candide and Cunegon plan to marry, right? We're getting closer. We're getting to the happily ever after, right? Uh, but as soon as they arrive in Buenos Aires, which is in present day Argentina, the governor, Don Fernando, proposes to Cunegonde. Thinking of her own financial welfare, she accepts, of course. And Cunegonde's probably thinking at this moment, like, bruh, I thought we just agreed to marry. <laughs> True. <laughs> then the authorities are looking for the murder murderer of the Grand Inquisitor, arrive from Portugal, and they pursue Candide, along with the newly, newly acquired valet called Cacambo, who I mentioned before. Candide flees to the territory controlled by Jesuits who are revolting against the Spanish government. There's our old friends, the Jesuits again. Uh, after demanding an audience with the Jesuit commander, Candide discovers that the commander is Cunegonde's brother, the Baron, who also managed to escape from the Bulgars. Candide announces he plans to marry Cunegonde, but the Baron insists that his sister will never mar marry a commoner. 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 Com commoner. There we go. Enraged. Mm. You know, because this this kind of stuff didn't happen. You had nobility, and then you had like everyone else, pretty much. Um, very kind of class tiered based system of society. Uh, enraged, guess what's going to happen, you guys? Candide he kills runs, him. He, yep, he runs at him. He just swords out, just psh, you know, once one slice, psh, dead. Um, so elimination. <laughs> So as you can imagine, uh, now he's got to run again. He and Kakambo escape into the wilderness where they narrowly avoid being beaten by the native tribe called the Big Lugs. I don't know if that was an actual tribe's tribe name. Could be, who knows? Uh, but anyways, they're they're traveling for several days. They find themselves in the land of El Dorado, the famed city of gold, where everything is golden and jewels litter the streets. It's a utopian country with advanced scientific knowledge no religious conflict. It's this uh, city of gold that's the embodiment of all these Enlightenment ideals. Hmm. But Candide longs to return to Cunegond. After a month in El Dorado, he gets kind of bored. <laughs> that's well, that's no. how it's described. He just gets bored. Um, he gets bored in the city of gold? Yes. Because it's just, oh, it's gold. Who cares? You know, whatever. The city's made out of it. What am I going to do? Um <laughs> He departs and he loads countless invaluable jewels into a swift pack sheep. Uh, when they, of course, reach the territory of Suriname, Candide sends Cacambo to Buenos Aires with instructions to use part of the fortune to purchase Cunegonde back from Don Fernando. And then they meet him in Venice, an unscrupulous merchant called Vanderderder. 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 <laughs> Something like that. Uh, Clearly. See, this, folks, is why you don't write out scripts. Because okay? <laughs> I had a way that I was reading it in my head, and then you actually have to say it, and it's like, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Not the same whatsoever. Um, but, you know, Vandadura steals much of Candide's fortune, kind of dampening his optimism somewhat. So then Candide sails off to France with his specifically chosen companion, an unrepentantly pessimistic scholar named Martin, who I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. On the way there, he discovers part of his fortune when a Spanish captain sinks Van der Urger's ship. Candide takes it as proof there is justice in the world, but Martin staunchly disagrees. So, after all that happens in Paris, Candide and Martin mingle with the social elite. Candide's fortune attracts a number of hangers-on, several of whom succeed at flinching jewels from him. Candide and Martin proceed to Venice, where, to Candide's dismay, Cunegonde and Cacambo are nowhere to be found. It's kind of a strange point in the book, because here he is traveling across the world, he's in pursuit of this girl, and then, oh, princess isn't in this castle, go somewhere else. <laughs> Great, okay, cool. Um, they do encounter uh, several colorful individuals there, including, including Paquette, the chambermaid turned prostitute who gave Pangloss syphilis. And Count Paco Carante, a wealthy Venetian who is hopelessly bored with the cultural treasures that surround him. Kind of sounds familiar with the Candide in uh, El Dorado, right? Mm -hmm. Or we'll callback there. 
Eventually, Kakambo, now a slave of the deposed Turkish monarch, surfaces. He explains Kunigan is in Constantinople. Like, oh, that's the castle over there. Go get it. Having There's no son. Constantinople. It's Istanbul. <laughs> it's Istanbul. <now. laughs> if you've a date in Constantinople, she'll be waiting in Istanbul. This is before all that. Nice try. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Kunigan is, of course, in Istanbul, present day Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. Everybody knows that. Uh, (laughs) We should stop doing a podcast now. I don't think we're going to get better than that moment. I think that that's as good as it gets, guys. (laughs) I think we're out of ideas. We got to throw in the towel. Uh, But, anyways, I think we won the game. Candide. In Constantinople, not Istanbul, eventually purchases Kakambo's freedom. Uh, and he discovers Pangloss and the Baron and the Turkish chain gang. Both have actually survived their apparent deaths and, after suffering various misfortunes, have arrived in Turkey. Despite everything, Pangloss remains an optimist and an overjoyed Candide purchases their freedom. He and his growing re- retune go and find Kunigan and the old woman. Kunigan has grown ugly since Candide has last saw her, but he purchases a freedom anyway. Good guy, Candide. What uh, a gentleman. Yeah. He looks like a... Aw, uh, she's ugly. <laughs> Guess I'll buy her freedom. I don't know. <laughs> kind of simping a little bit, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> he, uh, he then uses the remaining fortune to go and buy a farm outside of Constantinople. He's, he's had it with this traveling and chasing women across the world. He's just going to go buy a farm. Uh, but he keeps his longstanding promise to marry Kunigand, but only after being forced to send the Baron who still cannot abide by his sister, marrying a commoner back to the chain gang, because apparently he survived the, the killing. I don't know. It's very confusing. People... <laughs> he survived the killing. <laughs> he survived the, the knife fight with the, I don't know. People die and then come back to life. It's a miracle. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's Marvel. It's the it's Marvel, Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's the Voltaire Cinematic Universe. <laughs> uh, but eventually, you know, uh, Candide, Kunigan, Kakambo, Pangloss, and the old woman settle into a comfortable life on the farm, but soon find themselves growing bored and quarrelsome. Finally, Candide encounters a farmer who lives a simple life. He works hard. He avoids vice and leisure and everything in between. Inspired, Candide and his friends take back to cultivating a garden in earnest. All their time and energy goes into the work and none is left over for philosophical speculation. And at last, everyone is fulfilled and happy. And that's the end of the story. So how about that? (laughs) But uh, imagine reading this in Catholic high school for the first time, and that might have (laughs) been... That's where I read it for the first time. Or I, <laughs> yeah, it was it was something for sure. And then of course, you know, every good English teacher allows for like a discussion on this. Mm-hmm. And uh some of the points wouldn't be allowed by um a priest. Let's just say that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'd imagine. <laughs> Man, that's it sounds when you just like run through the plot like the worst tragedy you've ever watched. It's not a tragedy though, it's satire. It's what, but what's it satirical of life? I guess it's it's heavily satirical of optimism. Okay, so mm. there's a philosopher at this time, which apparently Voltaire had a a big spat with. Uh, his name is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and he publishes this book that caused Voltaire to attack and satirize it. Satirize it. So, in this book, it's called uh, Theodicy, the Theodicy. <laughs> He tries to justify the apparent imperfections in the world by claiming that this is the optimal among all possible worlds. Ah. That's again sounding pretty familiar, right? Yeah. It must be the best of all possible in the most balanced worlds because it was created by an all-powerful and all-knowing God who would not choose to create an imperfect world if a better world could be known to him or possible to exist. So that's, so that's where how the satire it. comes in is like, at in this story, he reaches rock bottom and yep. he still like feels nothing. And then he gets like all the way to the top. He's at the city of gold and he still feels nothing. And it's yep. just like that's the satire of it is if you're not perfectly positive, guess what? Life's still gonna happen to you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's optimistic through it all. Like, even after getting a, a huge beating and, you know, he's on the run from the law, he's in El Dorado. Well, this is the best of all possible world. This is the best of all possible. He says that, like, ad nauseum. Everyone says that until they're blue in the face, but it's really not. Like, despite all these evils that befall him, shit just happens. Okay? <laughs> and he's still positive through it all. It's it's not It's not logical. That's kind of the point I'm trying to draw home here is that being an optimist isn't logical in any way. It's not even rational. Um, what we do with the evil in the world, I mean, that's a big question. There's no shortage of it. If God is good and everything is for the best and good, why is there evil in the world if God is all-knowing and all-powerful? And that's kind of where Gottfried Liebenis is coming from. He tries to explain this. He tries to rationalize this in some way. Like, yes, there is an all-powerful and all-knowing God, but he created this world because it is the best of all possible worlds. And you can So his thing is like, yeah, it's bad, but this yeah. is the best that it gets. Yeah, like, exactly. It gets so much worse than this. And I guess the satire that they're trying to be like is like, hey, if God made it this bad and we're not trying to make it better, then what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot. Um it's kind of heavy. It's kind of heavy to think of, but that's, I mean, that's philosophy in a nutshell, really. It's yeah. things that lead you to more thought. It's just an endless rabbit hole of, okay, well, if this means this and that means that, then this must mean this. And, th- and then what if this happens? It's, it's a lot. It's, it's a, it's a brain treadmill, if you will. Well, but it has its purposes. This is, heavy. <laughs> this is heavy. Do you even lift Marty? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's an old meme. I'm sorry, mm. <laughs> but this is not to describe it discredit Liebness at all because he's a really smart guy but this is downright delusional uh and even syphilis he explains is for the best he's not upholding pessimism because humans love life that's why we don't kill ourselves but if el dorado is the utopia and is great then why is it extremely boring and most of this evil in the world is brought upon by us humans i mean yeah there's the occasional earthquake and wildfire and tsunami and all that but a lot of the things that were going on during the publishing of this book was brought upon by humans. The seven years war was a horribly bloody conflict that led to a lot of bloodshed that probably didn't need to happen over empirical, you know, dick waving for lack of a better term. Um, but he kind of shows that Pangloss hijacks this scientific narrative of like, you know, cause and effect. And, and there's a hypothesis. Now we have to test this hypothesis and all that. And he kind of twists it to his own ends and being like, well, you see, we have hands so that we can better better grip water jugs. See, this is why we have hands. <laughs> like, no, that's not how this works at all. <laughs> hmm. That's a little confusing. It is a little confusing. I mean, it's you scratch your head and you're wondering, like, why would anyone latch on to this idea of like Pangloss's unwavering optimism? But at the end of the I day, I guess it's, it's like, just it's easier. It's easier to just be like it could be worse. So I'll just be happy with what is, even if yeah. it's bad. Yeah. Um, but and is I this guess the best I get that. possible world. I don't know. Well, here's the thing is if you accept what you have, you never get better. And I think that's where the satire comes in because if it were the best of all possible worlds, he's sitting in the city of gold. Why would he leave unless he knew that he could get something better, you know, or not something better, just something different. Maybe. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's like, if this is the best it's going to get, what if I just want something else? Yeah. It's maybe like, that's uh, the satire of it. Yeah. It's like, I'm a, I'm a CEO. I'm in charge of like a giant company, but I'm kind of bored. So I'm going to go do something else now. <laughs> I'm going to go be a firefighter or a <laughs> spaceman. A... <laughs> that's what, that's literally the, the storyline of Elon Musk's life. He's like, <laughs> I'm so rich. Now I want to be a space man. <laughs> <laughs> is that the end all be all you just become well first step is don't be poor okay so that's number one don't number be two- born poor or else you're <laughs> not going to be a spaceman that's your first screw up in life i didn't have a choice in this uh Doesn't step matter. two is become an astronaut spaceman step space three man, astronaut profit step, step four profit <laughs> <laughs> hmm. i don't claim to have all the answers in life but what is this about the garden what do you make about that like they just they just end on this thing like we should go and work in our garden. I think that's probably one of the last things they say in the book. 
What that do you feels make of like that? a symbol. Mm-hmm. Symbol? Oh. Um, because, I mean, like we said, he's making a satire in a book that's pretty much like, you should be happy with what you have and just accept it. Yeah. Um, and I guess I kind of touched on this earlier, but it does sound more like when you when you say we should go work in our garden, it sounds like we should go work on society if it's not good. Like we shouldn't just be like, this is the best it is. We should go work on it. And if that's how they end it, then it's like we should go work on our lives uh, and we should never stop. Like that hmm. should be where we end it is still working on it. Yeah. Michael, do you have any thoughts? I don't know. Yeah. I, it's kind of similar to what I was thinking where it's like, um, it's essentially what I was thinking of. Like, if we're not going to be able to find the garden of Eden and find the best place that we possibly could, uh, why not create our own garden of Eden? Like why hey. not try and create our own best society? Yeah. We're getting biblical here. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's probably a metaphor for the garden of Eden. You know, we have to work to create, the Garden of Eden. Of course, Voltaire never blatantly said it. He just probably meant it as like a throwaway line where it's just, you know, whatever. But actually, this is a thing in philosophy. It's called quietism. Mm-hmm. So um, I, in full disclosure, I never took a philosophy class, okay? It's getting towards the end of the podcast. I should probably slide that in. Huge disclaimer. <laughs> um, <laughs> we talk about philosophy for... We talk about philosophy a lot for three people who have scar- scarcely interacted with philosophy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an important thing. It's yeah, uh, every it's it's involved in everyone's life, even if you didn't study it. Yeah, yeah. even choosing not to have a philosophy is a philosophy in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, the checkmate atheist. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <But> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this this garden thing. It's like, you know, what do you do with a life? What do you do with uh, what do you do with your personal garden? Should you focus on the outside world? Or should you focus inwards? Should you focus on, on yourself? Should you improve what is around you first before worrying about, you know, trimming your neighbor's yard, for instance? Um, I suppose you could kind of twist that into wow. a individualist type of rationale. But uh, believe it or not, there's the there's this philosophy of quietism, right? It sees the role of philosophy as broadly therapeutic or remedial. Quietist philosophers believe that philosophy has no positive thesis to contribute but rather that its value is in diffusing confusions in the linguistic and conceptual frameworks of other subjects, including the non-quietist philosophy, which is to say that, hey, I don't need to be perplexed by philosophy because it really doesn't serve me all that well to sit there and think about it. And you have undoubtedly felt this way at some point in your life, maybe today while you're listening to the podcast. In In today's day and age, it's okay not to identify with a philosophy or movement, especially if these type of thoughts make your head hurt. But if you do decide to entertain this, it's a great thought exercise to kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes or kind of understand where they're coming from. That's kind of what philosophy is. But the real moral contained in this book isn't to bury your head in the sand at the mere mention of metaphysics or optimism or quietism or anything like that, but rather to be aware that these philosophies exist. Know the world around you, but focus on what you can control. The metaphor of the garden can mean different things to different people, but what it means to me is focus your efforts inward. Take some time. Look towards your garden. Does it need to be weeded? Are you growing flowers? Do your plants bear fruit? Are you struggling to get anything to grow? See, those are all metaphors once again, but I want to thank you for listening, and I do hope that you do your reading assignment and entertain this book called Candide. Hey, that's really nice. Hey, thanks. You did it. You did a whole ass episode on a book of all things. I never do books. I always do books. It's nice that that somebody else is doing books too. See, I was it pushing myself to, to do a, a different thing. That's <laughs> lovely. I'm trying to tend my garden. Speaking of pushing things, let's push other people's products and go to our promotional spot. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> it's good. It's- Justin Wallace, Mitch Glasgow, and Deanna Cosby. Three daily commuters are joining forces to create the comedy podcast known as Carpool Shenanigans. Each week we'll take a topic, tell a story, and hopefully make your drive to work just a little less shitty. Now the episode's about to begin, so we ask that you sit back, relax, 
And of course, let's get weird. Hey, Cammy. Hey, Brian. What do Robin Hood, Vlad the Impaler, and Mothman have in common? IDK, what? Well, they're all topics on our podcast, Mystery, where each week we discuss a new myth and the history behind it. That's Myth Story with an I-E. See you then. Oh. Welcome back, guys. Thank you for listening to those little ads. Before we jump into anything else, we are going to do a quick this. I am the one who's going to do it this week because I'm the one who put all of the pieces together for the Star Wars thing, and it technically was my week, so it's my turn to do a quick this. So I will do that. I promise. <laughs> But before okay. we do, I want to talk a little bit about the Scene Snobs Network. Uh, usually I talk about it before the ad break, but guess what? I have rocks for brains and I forgot, so we're going to do it after. <laughs> uh, the Scene Snobs Network is a network of podcasts all talking about everything under the sun. They got um, they have a mental health podcast. They have podcasts that talk strictly about movies. They have podcasts that talk about uh, one that we like and that you guys just listened to the ad for called Myth Story that talks mm -hmm. about um, myths and their involvement with culture today and all of that. Um, they have creative writing podcasts and things like that. They have a bunch of stuff over at thescenesnobs.com. You guys should go check them out. We thank them so much for allowing us to be in their network. Uh, that is all that I will say on the Scene Snobs. But go check them out. That's scenesnobs.com. Um, okay. Are you guys ready for a quick this? I, I can. I I have one that I'm actually really excited to talk about this week. Um, so if somebody wants to start the timer, I'm not giving you a single second for free. Get your money for nothing and your seconds for free. All right. That's philosophy. Oof. Is it starting? And go. Oh, okay. So uh, for those of you who don't follow my personal Twitter account, you guys are really missing out because I've, tweet some quality stuff a lot of really good goofs gaffes and jokes i'm gonna go ahead and plug my personal twitter real quick in my quick this because i earned it um <laughs> you can follow me uh i'm at alex steel for real but what i want to get into is three days ago i sent out a tweet uh and the tweet read as follows it says stop what you're doing right now and go watch two distant mm -hmm. strangers on netflix it's only 30 minutes and it's so important did you guys see that tweet i don't think I nick is on twitter tweet. but did Not you did you take my advice? Did you heed it and go watch it? Like most things on this show, I did not. Fair enough. Well, I'm going <laughs> to tell you right now that um, there is a short film on Netflix that was released in 2020. It was actually made in 2020 as well during the time of the pandemic. But it is so important that I can see why they took the time to go and make it. The It's called uh, Two Distant Strangers. It's already won a lot of awards. Uh, it's already won an Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film and African American Film Critics Association Best Short Film Award as well. Um, the premise of Two Distant Strangers is it is Groundhog's Day for an African American man who is having a repeated run in with a police officer. Mm. I heard so, about this. It starts out, he wakes up after sleeping at a girl's house who he had met the night before. It's their first time sleeping together, but you can tell by the context that this is going to develop into a longer term relationship. Um, he, the basic plot is he wakes up and he has to leave because he has a dog at home that he needs to go feed because he wasn't home mm -hmm. the night before. Uh, some of the first shots of this is like watching the dog in the apartment, like looking at the door and like crying and a lot like that. <laughs> um, and he's basically like, I have to go home and feed my dog. And she's like, oh, that's a likely excuse. He's like, no, 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 sit down. I'll show you pictures. Start showing him pictures of the, or start showing her pictures of the dog. And he leaves her apartment, um, does a little FaceTime with his dog on one of the coolest devices I've ever seen. Cause it like plops out treats like he's talking mm -hmm. to his dog and the dog's like looking at the camera. He presses the button and two treats come out and he's like, just have all the treats, have them all. <laughs> and like it's it's dispensing a bunch of treats on the ground that the dog's eating. Oh, and he goes outside. Um, And this is kind of where the beauty in this film starts, because before then, it's just an introduction to characters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the first things that we see is he walks outside. He lights a cigarette, he puts it in his mouth. 
and a woman behind him passes and he's like, oh, hey, good morning. Um, and it's a Caucasian woman who, as he looks at her, she grabs onto her purse and holds it tighter to herself. It's subtle. And if you're not paying attention to it, you'll miss it. But that is in by definition, like one of the one of the main things about this movie is there are so many subtle things happening that are so uh, to, to the like African-American experience in America right now, they're like so telling. Um, but the basic premise is after lighting up a cigarette, uh, he has a run in with a cop who says that's not a very cigarette smelling cigarette, basically implying like you're currently mm -hmm. smoking weed. He's also a freelance cartoonist, um, and because of that, he gets paid in cash, so he has a large bundle of cash in his bag as well. And after seeing that, the cop decides that he's going to search him. Um, basically, he's like, you have no right to do this. You have no proof. You're not going to search me. I'm not going to let you. Things like that. The cop uh, takes him to the ground and calls for backup, where like three more cops come from around the corner. And we basically watch the, uh, the death of George Floyd play out in front of us in a mm -hmm. different manner where like the knee is on the neck and for a very long time we're watching him as he's like i can't breathe i can't breathe i can't breathe and we watch this character in the first five minutes die um <laughs> as he dies he wakes up back in bed and he's back in the girl's bed the morning starts over including like the bottle breaking and it's your basic groundhog's day formula where they mm -hmm. show you all the little details to prove like this is the same day he goes outside um and after being like a little confused, he runs into the cop again, because at this point, he just thinks it's a nightmare. And when the cop uh, basically tries to like take him down again, he doesn't let him. And the cop shoots him in a way similar to um, the uh, Trayvon Martin uh, police brutality thing that happened. And there are a lot of these callbacks, one of them including a day where he decides he's not going to go out. He's going to stay in the apartment with her because then the cop can't get him. The cops bust down the door and shoot him, finding out they're in the wrong apartment. And that's a reference to the Breonna Taylor mm -hmm. uh, police brutality thing. <laughs> I have I feel weird saying killing because I know that's what it was, but it just it makes me so sad to think about. So I'm avoiding saying the word, but it is important that these were these were killings of these people. Yeah, I think it's important um, to use the word. Yeah, like, I agree. Is, yeah. yeah, and it's, I don't know, it's a hard topic for me to talk about, but it's such an important film that you should go and watch because for the next, like, 50 tries, he just tries running, running away from this cop. And every time there's a montage where you see him, like, I'm over my five minutes, but this feels important. Yeah, no, I, it is. You see I'm him, a, like, um, you see him, like, getting shot over and over and over again in different ways. And finally, he breaks down to like the girl that he slept with, who now he has spent um, 99 days with. They reference how many days he's been in this. And he goes, what would you do if you knew that somebody was trying to kill you? And she's like, I'd kill him first. And like they laugh it off. And then she's like, no, but for real, I would talk to him. Like I would like sit down with him. I'd have a conversation and be like, why are you doing this? So he goes outside and he walks straight up to the police officer whose name is Officer Merck, um, <laughs> which is ironic. Mm -hmm. And he goes, like, why are you killing me? And he's like, what are you talking about? Like accusing him of being high somewhere. And he's like, no, 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 watch. And he points to the corner. And he says, those two are about to kiss. And the two kiss. And he's like, yoga girl in pants is about to take a selfie. She stops and takes a selfie. And then he starts telling the officer all this stuff that he's learned about him. Like, your mom's about to call. If you don't kill me in the first five minutes, she usually calls you his phone starts ringing and the cops like, Holy shit. Like this is real. This is happening. And he's like, come on, man. Like today, like let's make a difference. Like, just let me go. And he's like, all right, if what you're saying is true, then you better get the hell out of here. And he goes, okay. And he walks away. And as he turns the corner, there are, there's a cop car there and somebody who broke in across the street, two Caucasian men come running at the camera because the cops are chasing them. The only man standing in the alley, though, is our main character, who is then accused and shot by different cops. Mm. So then immediately we cut back to Officer Merck in the next round. And he's like, holy shit, man, like, what are we going to do? And he's like, dude, why don't you just drive me home? And so then we get one of the most important scenes in the film, which is this conversation between the cop and the uh, main character 
where they're discussing like the relationship between police officers and African American people in America. And in it, like he's trying to appeal to like his humanitarianism and like he's trying to explain the situation from his point of view. And the cop the entire time is just like listening along and he's like being respectful of it. And for a while you think like, oh man, this is really nice. And then he gets out of the car at his apartment. And he's like, I finally made it home. And the cop just starts clapping. And he's like, that one was really good. That one, you almost had me. He said that right there, that was the best one out of the bunch. And you realize that even though the conversation happened, it didn't stop the inevitable because the cop, for no reason, pulls out his gun and shoots the main character anyway. No. Oh, my God. And you're left thinking like, is because the cop in this moment seems very aware of the time loop because he says, I'll see you tomorrow. Like he knows that mm -hmm. they're both stuck in this. And that's like straight symbolism. There's nothing to that except like it breaks the narrative flow because the cop now is involved in a kind of fourth wall break. But it's more of the symbolism of you can talk about it all you want, but that's still not doing anything clearly because people are still dying. Um, so we ended on him waking back up in bed and his girl that he had just slept with, she's like, so if all this is true, what are you going to do? And he just says, I'm not going to give up whatever it takes. I'm going to keep trying because one of these days I'm going to make it home to my goddamn dog. And then it shows a list and it's not a complete list, but it goes on for a while, almost in kind of the replacement of the credits, but it lists out like something like a hundred names of people who have died from police brutality. And a lot of them like say they were just walking to the store. They were just like visiting their grandma. They were just asleep in their bed. And like, it ends with like, say their name. And it's this like super important message of this is something we need to talk about. And I think they knew that making it a groundhog's day type thing would pull more people in than if they advertised it as to what it was. Cause people love groundhog's day and they love the mm -hmm. trope of groundhog's day. And, mm -hmm. um, I know that I turned it on because I was like, oh, Groundhog's Day. I, I like Groundhog's Day. But yeah, then watching really? it, I was Classic. like, I was like, this is so important. Um, so anybody watching right now, I did not do this justice. I may have spoiled a couple of things, but I did not do this film justice at all. It's a 30 minute film. You can sit down, watch it, judge for yourself. I think it's important, it, at least in understanding if you are in a position where you are privileged enough to not deal with police brutality or the worry of police brutality. I think watching this at least gives you a window into what it's like uh, for people who do experience it so that you may be a bit more empathetic um, towards the cause if maybe it's something you don't understand. I think it's super important. You should go check it out. It's on Netflix. It's called Two Distant Strangers. And uh, that's it. That's it for me. <laughs> nice. Nice yeah. job. Needs to be said. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure so that's my recommendation for this week go check it out um kind of ending on a somber note but if there's anything out there in the world that you want to see us cover here on the show something entertainment based that you just think should get out there like you know you want to talk about mm -hmm. a, a play or a musical or a book or <laughs> If you want to okay, talk about something important, you like. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all the things that you just talked about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, if if you just find something that you think is important and that more people need exposure to, send them our way. You can email us at uh, we are entertain this podcast at gmail.com or you can go to our website, entertain this.net. Scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and there's a questionnaire that you can fill out. Those get sent straight to our email too. It's a little bit easier for you. Um, you can do that, or you can reach out to us on our social medias. You can find us on Twitter. We are uh, at entertain uh, underscore this. You can find us on our Instagram. We are um, entertain this podcast. We also have a Facebook group. If you look up entertain this with the three dots, which I think is called an ellipses. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Correct. Okay, great. Entertain <laughs> this with an ellipses at the end. Um, you can find us there. Uh, we also have a YouTube page if you want to have a more visual experience for our audio listeners out there and get what all of the visual jokes that we accidentally do because we forget where a podcast are, like Michael's eyebrows right now. <laughs> you can totally do that. Uh, the, the, the thing I'm trying to say is entertain us so we can entertain you and you can entertain this. We'll see you next Friday. 
Bye. 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 This episode of Entertain This was written by me, Nick Mustakangas, with additional commentary from Michael Savoya and Alex Steele. Our showrunner and resident fact checker is Chloe Price. Our theme music is Rush Bubble by Aaron Spencer, with additional interstitial music by DJW. Tune in every Friday for new episodes, and thanks for listening. <laughs>